It's Thursday. It's Think Tech. It's the 11 o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel, and we're talking about Trumpville, what's next? Oops, Coronaville, what's next? And the topic of the day is, uh, will we do any better on COVID if Trump stays in office? Uh, with uh, Tim Apicella, uh, Winston Welch, uh, Stephanie Dalton, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair, as opposed to all the other Cynthia Sinclairs in the world. Okay. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the show, you guys. Uh, so my question to you is the title question, Tim. Will we do any better on COVID if Trump stays in office? My answer is a resounding no. And the reason I say that is because if you look at the last two to three months, Donald Trump and his administration, Scott Atlas, um, they haven't really done a whole lot of anything. In fact, if anything, they've, they've increased uh, the COVID ca cases and increase COVID deaths by having these outdoor rallies, indoor rallies uh, with hundreds, thousands of Donald Trump's followers, elbow to elbow, cheek to cheek without any masks. And we know that the virus is highly um, transmittable in the air, not just droplet form, but aerosol form. So has he done anything? Yes, he's made it worse. And uh, I think his approach, whether he announced it or not, I think he has adopted Scott Atlas's uh, philosophy about herd immunity, and he's just trying to get um, get to the point where we could finally issue a vaccine and do nothing about it. So the answer is we are going to do worse. Hmm. Okay. What What do you think about this, uh, Cynthia? I mean, he said he, he gives himself an A plus. He said he saved somewhere between two and two and a half million lives, um, and he's made all kinds of grand steps and progress in terms of dealing with it. And, and 30 or 40 million people in the country accept that completely. What about you? No, I don't accept it. And Dr. Fauci was being interviewed this morning in regards to this vaccine that's supposed to come out, this wonderful vaccine that isn't even close to getting the 98% rating that it's supposed to get from any of the companies that are making them. And Dr. Fauci says, we're not supposed to approve it. The, the CDC and the FDA are not supposed to approve it until it has a 98% success rate. Well, none of them do. And now Trump is talking about getting rid of that so he can just override what they say um, and make it be approved, whether it is actually safe or not. And that scares me because of all the people that do believe what he says. and. And they're at risk to taking a, a, a medicine that is brand new, never been used, um, and it could be deadly. Could be as deadly as the flu. We don't know. We're talking about a sole proprietorship government. You know, I remember when he did the uh, the trade war and imposed tariffs. That was all him. That was not the Department of Commerce. It wasn't. You know, it wasn't the State Department. It was just him. Woke up one morning. Uh, most recently, he woke up one morning and approved the deal for the sale of TikTok, which I think he has uh, ulterior motivations for, uh, even after saying that it was a security risk. And bingo, one morning he approved it all by himself as a sole proprietor. So, Stephanie, you know, what do you think? I mean, uh, is, is, is he right about this? Um, and uh, uh, will he continue to do the same kind of thing if he stays in power? Maybe, maybe he'll see the light. What do you think? There's, there's a real big principle um, in the social sciences, and that is the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, <laughs> and that is reliable. And uh, so nothing is going to change, absolutely nothing. It will get worse. It could get worse, but it's definitely basically not going to change. Remember, I mean, he, he, there's no reason to expect it that hasn't changed, she's just continued on the same trajectory. And so there's no reason to expect that there would be a difference. Well, if, if he does, uh, if he does um, his uh, herd immunity thing, and if the uh, vaccine is e either ineffective or, you know, delayed in the deploy, you know, because some people won't take it, won't have the, you know, desired effect on the population, uh, things could get a lot worse. I think, you know, beyond where he is now. We're 200,000 and, and, and then you question the CDC because the CDC is no longer its own man or woman. Uh, so the, are those numbers real? Uh, I think we'll have a lot of lying going forward about that. Well, remember that President Ford did the same thing about the, the swine flu 
um, I think. Anyway, he did it and there was a disaster and there were some losses and he uh, rushed it and it had to be done. So we, we already have done this one time. So are we going to do that again? So I want to admit to you an, an ulterior motive in, in, in uh, you know, making the title, will we do any better on COVID if Trump stays in office? Because what I really want to do is get to the second part of that is, will Trump stay in office? And I would like to refer to uh, an article uh, that I mentioned in, our, uh, in, in Tim's show yesterday on uh, Trump Week. And it's the, uh, the, article in the, entitled, uh, the article in the Atlantic, which is entitled, The Election That Could Break America. A tagline is, if the vote is close, Donald Trump could easily throw the election into chaos and subvert the result. Who will stop him? That's the article by Barton Gilman. And in fact, uh, I think his name is Goldberg, Jeffrey Goldberg, the same fellow who wrote the article about what Trump, the names that Trump calls the military a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's the editor of The Atlantic. And he wrote a little piece saying, you know, I was going to hold this till October, um, but I think it's so important we, we have it now. And so this article, which I mentioned, is, is being talked all over town and a couple of references to it on, a, on network TV yesterday. So I want to read one paragraph to you guys and ask you to react, okay? And he's trying to give us, Gelman is trying to give us some advice here. What can we do? Because, because there's so many provisions, flaws, if you will, in the Constitution that let, that, that let Trump drive a truck through it and pervert the result that we really have to consider what, what to do. So here it is. I'll read it fast. If you're a voter, think about voting in person. More than half a million postal votes were rejected already in this year's primaries, even without Trump trying to suppress them. Uh, if you're at relatively low risk for COVID, volunteer to work at the polls. If you know people who are open to reason, spread word that it is normal for the results to keep changing after election night. If you manage news coverage, maybe like we do, anticipate extra constitutional measures and position reporters and crews to respond to them. We can and should do that. Uh, if you are an election administrator, plan for contingencies, surprises you never had to imagine before. If you're a mayor, consider how to deploy your police to ward off interlopers with bad intent. If you're a law enforcement officer, protect the freedom to vote. If you're a legislator, choose not to participate in chicanery. If you're a judge on the bench in a battleground state, refresh your acquaintance with election case law. If you have a place in the military chain of command, remember your duty to turn aside unlawful orders. If you're a civil servant, know that your country needs you more than ever to do the right thing when you're asked to do otherwise. Winston, your reaction, please. Well, uh, it's a sobering article, and we've seen other things like this, but not as well laid out as the 37 pages of this article. And it's important that people sit down with it and actually read it, because it shows we've been relying on norms for in all of our lifetimes. We can't remember anybody that violated the norms like this, but there are absolutely so many places this could go wrong, and it's already being pre-planned, as this article has shown. There are things that we can do. We're not powerless in this. Number one is that we have people go and vote in person. Uh, I think Uber and, and Lyft are gonna take people to the polls if they want to for free. Uh, see if your neighbors need a ride. Uh, make sure that people are actually voting. Um, even if they're, they think their vote doesn't matter, it very well may matter. Um, a lot of organizations have information I think that they're gonna start rolling out with and pounding people with from the New York Times, the Common Cause, the American Bar Association, the Brennan Center. There's a lot of organizations out there, protect the vote, uh, just Google it. How do I protect the election? How do I protect the vote? We are not powerless. We shouldn't think we're powerless just because this man says he's going to stay in office uh, and not leave, violate um, uh, the constitution, ignore that, not commit to a peaceful transfer of power. This hopefully when you, even people that are his fervent supporters should say, wait a minute here, if the majority of people, although they didn't last time, but let's just say if he loses the election according to the way that our laws work right now, um, flat out loses, like say Hillary Clinton did last time, even though she won the popular vote, but she lost the election. Okay, we understand it's not simple, but if he loses, will they understand that it's our very 
basic nation at stake here. It's not about what he believes in or that he's against this or for that. It's that our very underpinnings of a nation are at stake. And we have to go back in after, hopefully, and enough people will show up in the polls, will vote early, will sign their, their forms if they mail them in, so that we can repair these these holes that you can drive a truck through in our in our laws and our constitution and our voting systems in our uh, uh, our what what were norms before that we actually go up and shore those up so that this cannot happen again uh, because it will if we don't uh, it, assuming that we get past this election which I think we will I still have faith in our countrymen that the more egregious the statements are that he comes down the pike and says this. That said, I, you know, I was just reading an article last night that said 40% of Americans are basically authoritarian or mostly authoritarian in their outlook so that this type of thing from Donald Trump is, is absolutely appealing to them. And uh, so we just need to recognize uh, okay. that they are not our enemies. It can be done. We can, can be done. Meet, meet this challenge. Tim, do you believe it can be done? Um, perhaps. Um, before I answer the question, I just want to give a little background on, on to my answer, and that is: remember, last yesterday, Donald Trump said uh, to the question about will you guarantee a peaceful transition, um, and he said, "Get rid of the ballots, and we'll have a very peaceful. There won't be a transfer, frankly. There'll be a continuation. So the first thing I think a citizen can do is demand that to their legislators, their their House members, and their their senators at the state level, number one, will you count the vote? Will you count these ballots and not accept Donald Trump's premise that they're flawed, fraud? And will you accept them as a valid count? And then secondly, will you commit to a peaceful transfer of power and not subvert um, election law and not subvert the intent of uh, the electoral system? And I think that's something that voters can do on a local level so that they don't feel uh, helpless. And I, I certainly agree that you get to the polls as many as you can versus uh, maybe mail-in ballots now. Um, so I, I think there is still opportunities for this election to take place without a uh, cataclysmic um, exchange, if you will. You know, we, we, uh, we had a show last week with a fellow named Freeman in New Jersey. And he belongs to a, a group that make telephone calls to various voters in various states uh, to try to confirm that they will vote for Biden in his case. Um, and, it, you know, it's it's national. It's uh, it's cross state lines. Do You think that people in Hawaii can do anything to ensure that the that the voting rights of the people in, say, Illinois are being respected? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I know someone personally in my the building I live in. Uh, he's written probably 1,500 postcards from Hawaii, just reminding them of the importance of this vote and why they should, uh, if they've never voted before, to register, or if they are registered, why this one is important for them to get out of their chair and, and do something about it. So a handwritten uh, postcard, you know, reflecting the beauty of paradise here in Hawaii, sent to someone in Ohio or Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or Michigan. Um, you know, you tend to kind of see that come in the mail and you go, this isn't junk mail. This is someone took, you know, at least five to 10 minutes to write this postcard. Uh, let me read it. Yeah, valuable. I hope that happens, at least to some extent. Uh, Stephanie, where, where are you on this? Are you confident that uh, the United States will continue as a constitutional republic democracy uh, under the Constitution? Or, or will, it, will it fail uh, for the lack of, uh, 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 of an honest ballot? Well, well, first of all, uh, I want to say that um, it's already been done to a great extent. I, I think that we're already uh, ready to go over the cliff because the entire executive branch is under the the president's control. There's there are no uh, act there are no real secretaries. Everybody's acting. Um, the word is out that you have to uh, get with the party line or you're gone. So the entire executive branch is under his control. He is running the entire federal government. And that's what that means. So um, my, my faith uh, in that changing, if uh, past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior, 
nothing that is only going to get worse and more stringent and this people working for the fed will be just like they do in china you know you know they have to say what they're supposed to say but one of the things that is amazing to me is that donald at Trump, like Hillary Clinton, doesn't see maybe for different reasons, but Hillary Clinton never really paid attention to what was out there, that some of us were not interested in her candidacy. She never really got informed about that. I don't know that her staff looked at that. Obviously, there were tremendous trends, tremendous waves of people who were very conflicted about that, that nominee. So I think going back and looking at that is important to do for what the Democratic Party did. I mean, she was, you know, um, anyway. So the other problem is that Donald Trump doesn't realize that such a huge swath of the population doesn't want him. He's not at all aware of that to the same degree as Hillary Clinton. Well, let, me, let me put that to Stephanie. Stephanie, you think that Donald Trump is closer to the heartland, you know, to the way people feel in this country? Um, does he understand, does, does he know how to relate to them better than Biden, or does Biden understand more about how to relate to the, the voting electorate? Well, I'm responding uh, to that very good question. I, I respond in terms of the anti-intellectualism that seems to be flowing and that people want the knee jerk, they want the practical response to a problem. Oh, they're rioting in Spokane. Oh, well then send in the US Army and take care of it. You know, I think it's that anti complex, you know, uh, subterranean work to solve problems. It's kind of like this direct hit, you know, sort of a caveman <laughs> approach. Cynthia, what are, you, what are your thoughts about this? Well, I'll tell you, I think the most dangerous time and the most important time that people focus on is in between when the votes arrive and when the decision has been made. Because that's where the violence will happen. That's where we open up that the opportunity for Trump to take this all over and pervert the, the results. And you know me, I've been screaming from the rooftops uh, about election security, it's too late now, I'm sorry. But I believe, I, I hope, and I love the idea of the postcards and I hope like Tim and Win Winston, but I'm more in the camp with Stephanie that it's too late. The cast, the die has been cast, it's like too late. Um, we can try and inform people not to go in the streets so that the only people in the streets are the bad actors because we've got to stay, or it's going to be martial law just like that before we can even turn around. And well, then, it could happen right now in Kentucky. Yes, exactly. After Louisville, after this newest Breonna Taylor um, results, no officers charged except for one for shooting into somebody else's house, um, not even addressing the fact that this woman was shot in her own home. And, and you know, they've done so many false narratives about it too, that it's hard to even know the truth. Well, so, you know, Tim, I, you know, we were talking before about um, the continuum, you know, from the time of the Women's March, which is right after the inauguration in 2017 till now, people have gotten tired, or at least they become less confident that the government will actually listen to them. Uh, and therefore some of the, you know, the moves that are suggested by Wellman in the article may not, may not be mm, um, viable anymore. Uh, query whether people are gonna go down to their Senator's office and bang on the door and try to persuade that Senator to come around um, or whether people will go into the street uh, on things other than race uh, things, you know, about the election and counting votes, voter rights, if you will, or voter counting, which is even more deadly. Uh, what do you think about the view of the population? Have we, have we gone into a kind of zone where people are really damn tired about this? Oh, we're there. We've been there for months and months and months. Uh, apathy is set in. And I think a reason for some of that apathy is to look at their elected leaders um, you know, the, the check and balance of the constitutional system that we have of where the senators would rise up and say, wait a minute, 
this is clearly against the norm of uh, how we run a government. And but that hasn't happened. The Republican senators um, have been mute. Um, you know, the only one really trying to figure out what's going on has been the the media, and they have been following the shiny objects. So I think I think the public is tired of following the shiny objects. They're burnt out, and so yes, they you know they're complacent at this point. But I think if they see the the democratic electoral system being picked apart, and they may raise up and say, wait a minute, this is a bridge too far. And they, I, I don't want to see them go take to the streets. I agree with Cynthia. We don't need to play into Donald Trump's hand of, of creating a, an environment where martial law could be the order of the day. Where, uh -huh. that, where that dissension needs to take place is in, in Congress. You know, their right to petition the government of their grievances. So let's, let's, let's go to the media for a minute. You know, my observation watching uh, uh, MSNBC and CNN and others, but not Fox, because I, I have a rule about Fox. I don't know if I told you about my rule about Fox. I will go and listen to Fox and wait for the first lie. And, and then I turn it off. And, I, and invariably, uh, within the first 15 seconds, I, I turn it off um, because there is a first lie. But let's talk, about, let's talk about the media in general. As somebody said, I, I forget who here, maybe Cynthia, um, that we're always following the shiny objects. Um, and, um, and, and the media follows the shiny objects and they don't really connect the dots, such as we try to do here on Think Tech. Um, and, and so what, what should we be looking for now in this last month or so? Um, you know, as good viewers, as good analysts, as good reporters, if you will, volunteer journalists, what should we be focusing on? Uh, should we, what, what, what should be our mindset about avoiding being led down a path of shiny objects? That's a great question. Uh, the media, you know, by nature, is it just, it's not been doing the in-depth reporting of the Atlantic, of Vanity Fair, of, of the you know, New York Magazine. The, these, uh, even things like Politico, which are shorter and easier to digest, but when you're asking someone to sit down and read a 30 page, 37 page, whatever, even longer than, you know, three paragraphs, it's hard for people in this day and age. They can't focus. They're overwhelmed. They're exhausted. And they are so fatigued with all of this. And they either like the guy or they don't. But, but the article that you're talking about, which you should put a link in uh, under this show uh, to, the, to the Atlantic article, really lays out, this is it, folks. If you ha can spend 30 minutes of your life or 15 or, or, or 20 or whatever it is that it takes you to get through this article and read it and inform yourselves of the real grave issues here, then do it. And that's what we can do is get out that message that says, hey, we may have differences of opinion on this or that or these rights or those rights, but none of us are gonna have rights here pretty soon if we don't take back the basic mechanism of how the framework of how we are supposed to be. And you, as Tim was saying, there's not one Republican has stood up and said, I have some qualms about this when the leader of the country says he would not commit to a peaceful transfer. Not one of 50 in the Senate could say that. Uh, you know, this is truly well, um, shocking. McConnell said that uh, he was, that he believed we were gonna, that he said in, in an affirmative fashion this morning in the Hill, I saw this, <clears throat> he said, we will have a peaceful transition of power. That's what he said. Oh, I, I, I don't so, yeah, Mitch McConnell, much. the voice of moral authority and I don't him, but that's what he all said. of the people. He, he leads us and guides us in such a beautiful, yeah. fatherly way. <laughs> so, I, Cynthia, let me go to you for a minute. We don't have much, much time left. And, mm -hmm. and that is, you know, so, so Biden has been making responses. Uh, and uh, I've had discussions with Tim about this. Uh, query, are these responses adequate? Uh, do they meet uh, Trump at the pass? Or are we, being, are we playing the Lord Fauntleroy rules here? And uh, really not 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 taking a position uh, that is calculated in the public mind to mean anything. Uh, are, the, are the Democrats being too soft? Well, I think that the press is being way too soft, and I think that Biden does need to get more aggressive in the things that he says. If he's going to make a claim about Trump and one of his deficiencies, then why not have the proof right there with him? You know, we always see these. These uh, politicians now, we didn't used to see them all the time, but we do now, with their little board in the back behind them as they're talking about whatever they're talking about. 
So I think Biden should get on the, the board with that and start doing it so that he can show what he's talking about. Here's the proof. You know, I'm not just spouting things against this president. I actually have proof these are things that he has done. So, in, and that's the offensive that Stephanie's been talking about for so long too. Instead of always being on the defensive, oh, I'm not, you know, do I look like a socialist that likes rioters? You know, instead of those kind of comments, why not immediately talk about the hate and the division that Trump has been, you know, I don't even, inflaming. I don't even know the word for it because it's, he's the one that's behind all of it. And yeah, he, so Stephanie, your name has been mentioned. Yes. Uh, do, you think, do you think that approach will actually work? Yes, and yes. That, yes. that will, 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 will avoid all the uh, uh, nefarious things that Trump and his friends have been doing to the election system. Yes, by offense and doing this Gelman article, and I haven't spent enough time on it, but from what I understand, he lays out the very, he, the, the media needs to out the states he lists, identifies that will send electors with new, with the agenda of Trump. So he has set up how that whole electoral college can operate to give him, give Trump the election. The media needs to focus on those states and their processes for getting these electors into, into the college, to the meeting the, where they make the final decision. It's a hard question, <laughs> Stephanie, but let me ask you this. So Trump is, uh, has, has been proactive in filing virtually thousands of lawsuits around the country uh, in order to try to muck up the election process. You think the Democrats ought to do the same thing? Uh, who yeah. would they sue? What would they say? And not only meeting Trump's suits and defending them, but making their own suits. Do you think that would be useful? Yes, you legal guys could do that. Where are our legal guys? We've got Tubin and we've got the, yeah, get those guys to work. What are they doing? Yes, action, please. It's action. Not worrying about who believes it, who knows it, who can check, blah, blah. No, it's action. We got to act. So get the lawyers doing the same damn, excuse me, the same thing and get those states outed that are going to mess around with the electoral top college. Okay. Which be now the most them. difficult question of all, Tim, we're going to have to close with you. Um, although I want to ask for key words after this. <laughs> so, Tim, <clears throat> what's Trump going to do here? How is this going to, you know, unfold? He this is week, going to, next week and so forth. He is going to take advantage of that which has not been addressed. He's going to continue to hammer on the fact that these ballots, these mail out ballots are full of fraud. And he will use that as a continual drum to beat so that he can put in his claim and delay this election. What we haven't done, argumentation 101. If Donald, claim, uh, Donald Trump's claim is that th this election is rigged and his, his evidence to support that claim is the mail-in ballots are fraudulent. No one has taken the time to say, no, ballots are not fraudulent and stick on that and stick on it and repeat it and take away his claim and the validity of his claim by proving mail-in ballots are not fraudulent and it convinced each and every state of secretary in each state that yes, you will count these ballots. And until that's done, Donald Trump will continue his path of uh, delegitimizing the, the vote process. Yeah, so it sounds like to me from what you're saying that Biden ought to be the countervailing voice here. He's, he's the other fellow in the election. Well, when he gets um, off a plane and says, what can I say? I mean, that's all he, <laughs> are you kidding me, Mr. Biden? <laughs> Are you, are you joking? Is that your response? What can I say? Yeah, he, he ought to match Trump point for point. He ought to call him on everything, including, you know, uh, uh, lies, including uh, statements he makes without evidence and so forth. I'm sorry to say this about the candidate that I'm now supporting, but feckless is the only word that comes to my mouth. Yeah, okay, well, uh, is, that, is that your word for the day, Tim? Uh, we, we're looking for a word for the day to best characterize this discussion to our viewers. So, so let, let, let's try to find another one aside from feckless. What, what have you well, got? You, if you want a word that summarizes how I feel, animosity. Okay, animosity for Tim. Okay, Stephanie, what's your word for the day? Democrats get to work. Do it. Go okay. up and do it. All right. 
Uh, and Cynthia, your word, how do you feel? Uh, terrified. You know, I was, I was thinking of my word a minute ago and it would have been abject fear. So I think you and I, we must be related. Uh, Winston, what's your word for the day? Yeah, I'm gonna go with reflection or introspection. Each of us needs to look inside of his or her heart and, dis and make the important choices. And you know, for Trump supporters out there, if you like him, he's a rebel, he's a renegade, whatever, you can still go into the booth and not vote for him and tell people that you did. <laughs> That's what the Lincoln That's Project safe. says. <laughs> yeah, because you're saving the, the nation. You're, <laughs> you're saving the nation for yourself, if nothing else. You know. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm going to say introspection. Look within. Be patriotic at a real level for the, the country that we all purport to love that we need yeah. to keep this country and, and move it forward in the best way possible for all of us. Thank you, Winston. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, Tim. A great discussion. See you next time. Take care. Aloha. Stay safe.